Well, daytime with us, the Navy, Stephen Smith's with me. Joining us right now, Hiya. rugby legend and actor Keith Mason. Hello, Keith. Hey, guys. Hey, Keith. And I have to say, Keith, you obviously, before we go any further here, obviously, we feel, we feel sorry for you for being involved in the uh, incident uh, last night as well, I have to say, with a train there. But obviously, the good news is the person that caused the incident is OK. I don't know if they're okay, Gaston, but uh, oh. I don't. I don't think the guy was actually okay. I don't think. Uh, I think it was suicide. But I think. Uh, so basically, I was in Manchester and I was coming back on the train, uh, the last train over to uh, to Leeds, and then uh, the train stopped between Huddersfield and Murfield, and uh, I thought it broken down, and then the conductor came and he said, "Oh, there's been a trespasser." I don't like well. That's yeah. probably enough saying that somebody's come on, you know, onto the tracks. And uh, so the next minute, five minutes later, I just seen all the ambulances rock up, all the police, uh, all the blue lights, and that were there. And then I saw, we, I was there for about an hour and a half. We were parked up for about an hour and a half. So I didn't get home last night until three a.m. Uh, and I saw the, the the paramedics walking down the side of the train to the back end of the train. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I was very you know, I wanted to know what had happened. It, it was very eerie on the train, very quiet. There were a lot of people on the train, but it was quiet. And then uh, the conductor just said, look, you know, he saw the guy come up the, the other end of the train. So I'm guessing the guy jumped in in front of the train and then the tr he's gone all the way underneath it. Uh, probably dragged him. And then he's come up the other end, at the back end. Uh, so the guy, yeah, I was in shock because I've never been, I've never, you know, I've never, I've never experienced anything like that. Uh, Oh, this dread inside of me, like you know, oh, what kind of place with this this person in for, for them to yeah. jump? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, uh, years and years ago, a good friend of mine called Simon did the same thing in, in Murfield. He jumped in front of the train, and I just you just you just gotta be oh, sorry, guys. You have just gotta be. Uh, are you, can you hear me? Yeah, me yeah, fine. Sorry, I just got a phone call, Snapchat coming from my phone. Uh, I turned it off. Uh, God bless the guy. And look, uh, it just puts everything in perspective because, you know, people go through, uh, people are going through struggles all yeah. the time. Yeah. It is, it is one of the, I think it's the number one killer of men, yeah. uh, suicide. Uh, uh, and it's tragic, and as I say, the only way forward is to be able to say, we said Gary Webster, uh, and he was talking about um, talking uh, and how important it is. Um, we come from a generation who talking didn't like to talk about well, anything, and that's so important, and people like yourself, they're getting a word out about mental health and everything, uh, it really does help. Um, uh, Keith, well, you, you, well, one of the things we want to talk to you about today, and there's lots to talk about, is you've actually started your own charity clothing line, and uh, could you tell us a little bit about it, please? Yeah, so basically, uh, I've always been the type of guy that likes to give back. I like to use my platform to, uh, you know, be an extra rugby player. Now going into the into entertainment business, I think one of the greatest gifts for for any person in the public eye or a celebrity is to be able to give back because generally they have a bigger reach of people they can reach out to. And I'm just the type of guy that likes to help people. And yeah. uh, they uh, a lady called Shalina Begum, who, who runs the Tafida Ricky Foundation, a little girl, uh, four or five years ago, had a headache and she woke up in the morning and uh, they couldn't find out what was up with her. But by the time she'd gone to three or four hospitals in the UK, uh, in the London, sorry, uh, she ended up with brain, well, she, she had a bad brain injury and she fought against the system. Uh, she's the first yeah. ever one against the system to keep her daughter alive. Yeah. Uh, Tafida now is in Italy with her mum, and her mum's been in an hospital room for four, for four years. You know, she's stayed with her for four years, but yeah. she's saying that the, the, the tragic thing about this is that, you know, there's no way back for Tafida, but she wants to make a change, and she reached out to me, and she asked me if I'd be the brand ambassador, and hence the reason why I brought my own non-profit line out, and, you know, people are starting to buy it. I don't get I don't get nothing from it. Uh, obviously, the the supplier gets his little bit for making the making the clothes. You know, yeah. like, how yeah. much you get? I'm not getting any. Oh God! Two seconds, guys. Sent an email. Is that one of the t-shirts you're wearing today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love it. They can be the hardcore fans because 
it's quite egotistical. But the guy said, look, let's put you on there when you're back in your playing days, running. Rise up, never give up. But there's, uh, I mean, that's the logo. It's yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. It's got, uh, we've got the buddies. Uh, I know, uh, I know the ladies like the, the grey tracksuits, by the way, you know, the, you know, the uh, joggers and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's great. Amen. I love it. Uh, but yeah, listen, I'm, I'm repping it out, guys. It's lovely. And, and I was I was looking at it online the other day, and it's quite reasonable. You know, it's not expensive, uh, and you're giving to a good cause by buying it, which, which is which is absolutely great. Listen, I have to say one of the things that I, I've followed you for a number of years, watching all you do for people, etc. And you're an inspiration to so many. And, and you played rugby lead. Now you've got your first lead in a, a big movie, uh, but life didn't start off easy for you, Keith, did it? No, uh, you know, I was a, I was a young, I was a youth offender as a as a young boy. Uh, I've notched up over sixty arrests and you know forty five court appearances before the age of fourteen. You know, I never, I never finished school. It's not because I was a, a bad kid. I was, I was naughty. I was undisciplined. You know, I had, I didn't have a father figure. It's no excuses. It's no excuses for for my behaviour. But the thing is, what I grew up around, Jude Bimore, a lot of my friends. Uh, there was no father figures about, so, you know, and I had, like, and I was diagnosed with ADHD as a, as a six-year-old kid, so I had all this energy, so I needed a release, you know, and, and what happens yeah. when you grow up in, you know, council estates and stuff, uh, it's not that the bad places, it's just that the kids are misguided, and, uh, you know, it's not, it's it's a lower class type of type of area, uh, but my mum did her best, you know, five, she, she brought five kids up on her own, literally. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah, and, you know, she gave me that. I wanted to make my mum proud. And, you know, going through all that situation, always, always it back in my mind, I always thought that I'd always turn, turn a negative into a positive. I had that belief in myself. Yeah. I feel like now as what I've achieved, you know, uh, in the sporting world and now going into entertainment business. And, you know, I even brought a, a comic book out called Ruby Blood, which was the first ever a comic about a rugby league player. But mm. what I did, I met the actual person autobiographical to my life. So David King was a character, was about a young kid who had to overcome struggles and mental health and depression and a life of crime to become a star player. And that's pretty much my life story. So, uh, you know, it's all about perseverance. And I, I, do you know what? Looking back now, I'm proud of that kid. I'm proud of that young Keith. How, how I turned my life around. I came out of court. For the forty fifth time, my friend went to jail, and I thought I can't fuck. Sorry, sorry, I can't fucking do this no more. I am going down miserable. I could see where my life was going, and I just had this, this, this fire inside of me. And I always said that, you know, we change through two different emotions, either yeah. through, either through pain or desperation. And I was desperate. I was desperate, and you know, sometimes in life, uncertainty is good for us because it, you know it. I, I truly believe that, you know. A man or woman's character is not judged by when we celebrate a victory, but, but, but what we do when our backs are against the wall. And I've really found out more about myself when I've been down and out. And, and yeah. I've messed up many yeah. times. In my and of, Keith, you mentioned ADHD there. I've uh, had to fight my own life as well, especially educating people with uh, autism as well. And about my autism on that front there but standing up to top bullies as well. But for anyone that's out there dealing with bullies and fighting to just be understood, do you have any advice for them? To be honest with you, you know what? Like I was, I could handle, I could, I could handle myself uh, as a young man. I'm, I mean, you know, I was well equipped. I was naturally gifted when it came to uh, being able to have a good scrap. And, uh, but I always looked after the kids at school had special needs. It's funny because I was a popular kid at school but I always, I mean, I go back to schools now, some of my schools. I never I never finished school, but they always they always ask me to go back there and, you know, do a talk or put a time capsule in. And even though I was a, a naughty boy at school, and some of the school teachers come up to me and goes, you know what, you were a lovely lad, you when you came back to, when you were at school, you know, you're a bit of a lovable rogue, but you used to look after all them kids who were with special needs. And, and that's, I've always been, I've always wanted to help the needy. Uh, I've always had an, a, an affiliate to to people who are not as well off as as maybe you, me, or anybody else. And it was a constant struggle for me with my ADHD, and you know, not, not having that father figure about, and, and and being confused as a kid, and people not understanding me. 
Uh, but like I said, with bullies and stuff, you know, I said to you know, I said to my kids, like, if someone puts you in a situation where you've got to fight back, you have to fight back. But the best, the best way about it is uh, if you can tell a teacher, you can tell somebody. Yeah. Or, or in the, I'm not saying. Listen, you know, if my my daughter, for instance, she was in the park the other day, and some kids who were a couple of years older than her came up to her and they started trying to bully her. Yeah. My daughter felt frightened, but she picked up the nearest stick and she goes, "You come near me, I'm going to hit you." And for <laughs> me, for me I, I was proud of that because she showed resilience. That yeah, the, and also Keith, there's a lot of embarrassment around bullying. Lots of kids sometimes can't ever tell anyone they're being bullied because they feel as they've let the family down. The number of times I've picked up that we're talking today and read about a child committing suicide, and the parent says, "I thought it was the most popular kid at school." Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. again, I think what Gary was saying is about talking to kids and and uh, saying it's okay if you've got a problem. Uh, it's not you, not your fault. Um, uh, I think that's really kind of the thing. But, but we move on just slightly here. Um, I mean, obviously, you're, you're an athlete and, and with so many sports personalities, you see fall into addiction and depression. Do you think there's enough done during the period when there are out there to educate them or help them in any way? No. Look, I'll be totally, I'll be totally honest with you. I, I, when I retired, I retired. I won a court case against my old club. Uh, that was a, that was a challenge in itself because I felt betrayed by my own agent who who, who was me and and the club who I played there for seven years, uh, and in rugby league you're in about all these players now with brain damage, uh, with dementia, getting dementia and stuff, and you know, listen, I won't rule myself out. You know, I hope I'm okay, but I played the game tough and I played it hard. Rugby league is probably the toughest sport in the world, team sport in the world. Uh, I know from my experience, when I retired, I struggled with depression. Uh, I turned to alcohol and, and, and loads of other shitty little habits. And uh, you generally get around people who are doing the same. I think it's important that you, you, you're you around people who love you and, and who, who yeah. make you accountable. But looking back in hindsight, I think I had to go through that. But not many people are going to go through that and then go on and be an entrepreneur and make movies and... Yeah. Uh, do what I'm doing, right? Because where I came from, I had to go through the struggle, for the storm and for the dirt to become Keith Mason, to become the man I am. Yeah. Uh, hence the reason the higher I get, the more people I can inspire and help. I think uh, there's not enough in place for these sports people. They really go down the swanee. And you think about this, I played rugby league from, from six years old all the way up to 31. That's all I've ever known. I played 14 years as a professional athlete. And then when it stops, what, what, am, I, what am I doing now? You've got to stay consistent and disciplined. You've, yeah. you've got to do things that made you great in the first place, and that's hard work. Yeah. So There's also, there's also the thing as an addiction is an illness. Um, yeah. I mean, often it comes from some yeah. kind of trauma or anything like that. So there's, you know, this again. I was talking back with someone last night and saying back in the day, if you had addiction, it was all your fault. Um, but it isn't, uh, and so I, I, I really think we should bring we should talk about it. Anyone that goes into sports or showbiz or anything like that, there's a danger of these things happening to you. Uh, very much so. There is that thing. There, there is that danger out there as well. And Stephen, you're absolutely right there because obviously championing it is another thing as well. But obviously if there's, if mental health is talked about in schools and it's something to, that we sure would be a champion in sports there. So do you think it should be talked about more in schools to help those that are going into like the sports industry, the acting well, industry, to understand him? Can, can I just say, uh, everybody's got some kind of trauma. Everybody's yeah. got trauma your childhood or from your parents or or from you know we've all, we all go through dark times in life uh what we what we don't get to, what we don't get teached is how to self-regulate as men and women how to self-regulate with our emotions yeah. so what we do is we tend to turn to self-destructive ways because we cannot deal with what we're going through in our mind and then we don't want to put that pressure onto anybody else so they feel like you feel like you're a burden to them so it's just a vicious cycle and they need to they need to teach kids how to self-regulate because the, even my daughter she suffers a panic attack she's 11 years old with anxiety with the stuff that she's seen and, and kind of gone through 
yeah. you know, and it could be small stuff. It could be stuff that they've seen in school and a kid gets beat up. That could be trauma for that kid for yeah. the rest, rest exactly. of their life. You know what I mean? And yeah, absolutely. Self-regulation, that's what, that's, what that's what we need to be taught how to regulate when we're, when we're struggling. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, we haven't so much. I oh, wish we had an hour. Oh, we had an hour with you, but uh, we've got. Uh, we're very excited. You've got a new movie coming out, uh, Imperative. How did you get into acting? You know what? Uh, t- t- it, was, it was ten years ago now. To the day uh, we got to a final, I was playing for Huddersfield Giants at the time. Uh, we played at Wembley in a, in a Challenge Cup final, two thousand and nine, against Huddersfield Giants. Uh, we came off second best that day, but it was ama- It was an amazing experience to play at Wembley. You know, I'd always dreamt of playing at Wembley, watching all the cup finals as a kid. Anyway, cut long story short, I got invited to Stringfellas after after the uh, after the final. A few of the boys, like you do, went to <laughs> back in 2009, and I remember Mickey Rock walking in through the door. He had the waist jacket on, big muscles, and that. I'm like, hey, that's Mickey Rock over there. My mate's like, oh, I went, never mind. I knew I was going to go over and say hello to him. Uh, I just recently watched a wrestler, which he got the BAFTA yeah, for. That's great, he did, didn't he? Hey, BAFTA, he got the Golden Globe. He just missed out on the Oscar. He should have got the Oscar. Uh, and I, I just says to uh, Derek, his, his uh, bodyguard, you know, can, can I say hello to Mickey? He goes, yeah, sure, know oh, you can. So I went out to Mickey, because I and Mickey were sat down, I shook his hand, and I said, how are you doing, Mickey? I really loved your film, The Wrestler. I mean, is that film about you? Was that film about a little bit like your life? You know, you had everything... Yeah. Yeah. I can't know what type of guy he was, but I didn't really. And he says, he goes, what are you, man? Are you a gangster? Are you an athlete? I went, <laughs> no, no, because uh, we, we all had gray suits on and, and black shirts. So we we had us cut final suits on. And I says, no, Mickey, I, 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 play, yo, I play rugby. I played in the final today at Wembley, believe it or not. And he went, you know what? I watched the game today at Wembley, rugby. Is that you? He went, yeah, he goes, I fucking love rugby. Then the next minute, he gave me his number. Uh, he goes, where are you going to be in two weeks? And I'm like, probably training. And he goes, well, why don't you come as my guest to the to the GQ Awards? I'm, I'm up for the man of the year. Oh, <laughs> so, nice one. So I did. And then, you know, we, we went to another, a few more clubs. He did a bit of arm wrestling. He snapped his bicep off the ball that same night. Uh, he invited me down to the GQ Awards. Jason stayed from giving him the man of the year award. And I met Jason and, and we were at the Royal Opera House and we were just part I was partying with movie stars basically and yeah. we just became friends and, and then he he flew me to Hollywood and New York a few times and then he put me in a film it's called Skin Traffic. And what what is the uh, secret to being a success here, Keith? Can you explain that to our listeners? The secret to being a success. Uh, what yeah. the secret to being a success? Right, I'll, I'll just I'll be really uh, plain and simple. <laughs> Uh, there's no secret sauce to being uh, successful. There's no, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do that. I think number one, you've got to believe in yourself. Uh, number two, you've got to have a vision, what you want to be. And the last two is consistency and discipline. Being consistent and being consistent day in, day out in your actions and discipline, doing the things that you don't really want to do, but you know you've got to do it. It's like when I read my film script and I'll read it about 100 times, I go over it and 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 over it. It's like going to the gym. If you stop going to the gym, you become out of shape. So yeah. I think consistency and discipline has always been my work ethic has always been uh, a, a bit uh, over the top. But that's what you need to be successful. Uh, some days you're not going to feel like you want to get out, but some days you do feel like you just don't want to do anything. But as long as you get back up and you keep trying, and I always say like. Never underestimate the small wins in life. And I think small wins throughout the week, throughout the day, uh, lead up to big wins. So it's all about, you know, accumulating good habits in your life, uh, setting setting your focus out. Look, I've done sport, I've gone into the acting, I've done the writing, uh, I've done a comic book. Uh, what else am I bloody doing? I've got my own clothing line now. I'm oh, just, right. you know, everything I do is is through love. It's just I lead with love. Even if I'm in the gym, I'm loving. Even if someone doesn't like me, I'm still sending love to that guy because I know that he's struggling. There's something going on in there because good people don't hate on people. They lift them up. You get people drag you down and you get people lift you up. Uh, but it's took me it's took me 10 years to even get a lead role in a film. 
you know, there were times I was jumping on buses to London for three or four years, five hours down, 10 minute audition, five hours back. People don't know this. I did this for three years and never got one gig. But I've done it. I've done the road work. Perseverance. Yeah. yeah, I've gone it. It's the worst. Listen, Keith, how can people find you uh, on TikTok? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm on all, all social sites and, and it bloody takes too much of my time up. But uh, Instagram, I'm on Keith Mason Official, uh, Real Keith Mason on Twitter, Keith Luke Mason on TikTok if you want to watch stupid, silly dances. And there's some inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been oh, fantastic uh, having you, uh, Keith. We're still honoured. I just plug my film as well. Uh, Absolutely. Parity is a film that I produced. Uh, I play uh, the lead detective, Jack Sullivan, DCI Jack Sullivan. He's hunting down a serial killer while trying to fight his own demons. Uh, I produced the film. We had the premiere last year. The film is now expected to come out in the USA next month, which is fantastic. They've renamed punished, and uh, it'll be it'll circulate worldwide. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year it'll be it'll be in the UK, and I've also landed another role in a film called The Chosen, where I play Detective Kevin O'Brien in a supernatural thriller. Okay, let me just tell you this: I believe in good karma. What goes around comes around. Ten years ago, Mickey Rock offered me a film, offered me a role in a film. For me, an, an opportunity in a lifetime. I had thirteen lines in the film. I played Mickey's henchman. I got three hundred pounds for that for that shoot, right? Fast forward 10 years, I've just landed a lead role in this. It's a big budget movie, right? I reached out to Mickey Rock and I have offered him a role. <laughs> 10 years <laughs> later, for a lot, a lot of money, well over $100,000 a oh, day. Oh, I wish you all the luck in the world. Yeah, it's great, it's great to have you on today, Kay. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. Have a, 